Good morning. Thank you for attending our webinar, Refrigerants and Cold Storage, Minimize Business Disruption in a World that Demands More, hosted by Comores. I'm Keith Berger, Marketing Specialist. We appreciate the opportunity to bring you valuable information concerning options for cold storage facilities. The webinar will begin momentarily. All participants are muted. Questions can be submitted through the GoToWebinar panel on the right of your computer screen at any time during the presentation. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation or in a follow-up after the webinar if we run out of time. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie Kopchik, Global Market Manager of Stationary Refrigerants. Stephanie? Thank you, Kate, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us again uh, for this webinar focused on refrigerants and cold storage. And uh, this uh, subtext couldn't be more true today in terms of the world demanding more from us. Uh, at this time. Uh, so actually, before we get started uh, in, in the meat of the presentation, uh, I just wanted to take a minute to uh, thank everybody on this call uh, and those in the industry that really are uh, doing a lot of work at this time to support the essential cold chain. Um, so whether you are a cold storage warehouse owner or operator, a mechanical contractor that services um, these essential buildings, a uh, wholesaler or distributor supporting contractors and end users or an equipment manufacturer yourself. Our refrigerants team really wants, just, wants you to know that we thank you for the work that you're doing and continue to do every day uh, to keep food out in the, in the um, cold chain and on people's, uh, in people's stores uh, and on their plates at home. So uh, thank you for that and thank you for taking time out of this crazy time, uh, crazy schedule to join us on this webinar, and hopefully this will be a valuable use of your time. So today, the agenda for our webinar, we'll start with a brief introduction to Comores and myself and the other presenters. Uh, I'll give a regulatory update uh, and then talk briefly about cold storage market trends and then go in a bit more in depth in refrigerants and talk about refrigerant selection and the role HFO refrigerants play in cold storage or can play in the future. Uh, and talk specifically about how Option refrigerants can help reduce business disruption uh, and help save downtime, capital, and operating costs. So for the introduction, I'll start with the introduction to Comores. Uh, Comores has been a company for five years now. We actually spun off from DuPont in 2015, and we were a spin-off of their performance chemicals division. So we are a global company. We have over 55 manufacturing and laboratory sites around the world, about 7,000 employees, and we operate in over 130 countries around the world. Uh, so when we spun off from DuPont, we brought with us the entire refrigerants business. Uh, so we inherited the, the heritage of DuPont with the, the invention of Freon refrigerants. And in the past decade or so, with the invention of Option refrigerants, the low global warming potential refrigerants, which we'll talk more about today, we've continued to develop those as Comores. So if you don't recognize the Comores name, hopefully you do, as we've been around for, for five years now, uh, you likely will rec recognize the DuPont and the Freon name. So just wanted to make sure to uh, remind folks of where, the, um, where, the, uh, where our background is from. So now if we go specifically to uh, today, as Kate said, my name is Stephanie Kopchik. I'm the global market manager for our stationary refrigerants business uh, in Comores. And I have joining with me uh, two panelists that will join us during the Q&A portion. Andrew Pansula is one of our technical service engineers and Jamie Hale is a senior technical support trainer. And so both of them will be available during the Q&A portion if you have any specific questions for them they'll be glad to answer them. Before I move on from this slide, I want to acknowledge another team member whose name, whose picture isn't on the slide, but you likely uh, at least know virtually from the many emails uh, being sent to you in advance of this webinar. Uh, you likely were receiving registration and confirmation emails from Matt McKinney. He's another member of our Option market development team. Uh, Matt actually got activated a week and a half ago uh, through the National Guard to go support some of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic activities. Um, and so we thank Matt for his service. 
and certainly look forward to him rejoining his team. Uh, but he's doing the most valuable thing he can do right now in supporting our country during this challenging time. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge Matt for the work he's doing and the work he did leading up to uh, this webinar as well. So with that, I'll start going into a regulatory update. So whenever I start talking about regulations, I feel like it's always helpful to ground us on what the drivers are behind the regulations that we're talking about, because it can get confusing if we don't do that. So uh, when you think about the environmental challenges that are driving regulations and industry transitions, um, they're really two main focus areas. And the item on the right, ozone depletion potential, this is something that's been discussed for several decades now and really is what led to the phase out regulations of CFCs and HCFCs. And so ozone depletion potential and reducing and eliminating products that have ozone depletion potential has to do with eliminating gases that contain chlorine. Uh, when those gases that contain chlorine, which is one of the C's in HCFCs and CFCs, get up into the atmosphere, they can react with the ozone layer and thin it out. And what that does is it can increase the potential for um, the harmful radiation from the sun to get through to us. Uh, so in 1987, all, uh, most of the countries of the world got together and agreed to eliminate the production of ozone depleting substances. And here in the U.S., we're at the very tail end of that now. Uh, we've completed the phase out of R22 production uh, as of January 1st of this year. If you, and I'll talk about that more in detail. If you switched over to the left, you see the other environmental challenge that the industry has been trying to grapple with over the past decade or so, and that's around global warming potential, or some people call it climate change. And I am not an environmental scientist, um, nor am I here to debate uh, any of the, the politics of it, but essentially global warming potential is the potential for a gas to trap heat in the atmosphere that can lead to climate change. So there are several greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, methane, et cetera. Um, our refrigerants um, also have, all of these gas are also considered greenhouse gases. They all have a certain atmospheric life. So if refrigerants escape equipment when it leaks or if it leaks, uh, and they go up into the atmosphere, they hang around for a period of time, just like CO2 and methane and other gases. And that buildup of gases on the outer layer of the atmosphere can prevent proper heat exchange, and that can result in climate change. So in um, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol was agreed to in 2016, and the agreement there was to phase down materials with higher global warming potential. So I'll talk about what each of these things mean in terms of regulations that impact your business here in the U.S., but I just wanted to start with that um, kind of overview of what the regulations are driving because they're driving different things. So again, on the right-hand side, the ozone depletion potential, this is a graph that's showing the phase-out schedule of R22 consumption in the U.S. per the EPA. So as I said, as of January 1st, 2020, there is no new production or import of R22 allowed in the U.S. So that means, it doesn't mean that there's no 22 available, period, but what it means is the only R22 available for service is R22 that has been pulled out of equipment and returned back through the reclaim channels uh, or any R22 that anybody has in inventory. So when we think about the original, you know, the title of this webinar around minimizing business disruption in a world that demands more, and we think about this segment of the industry, the cold storage segment, which does have many large systems. There are some smaller condensing units as well, but there are several large R22 systems out there. Um, and you think about the potential for business disruption if there's a catastrophic failure or, or a problem with a unit and having to procure that much gas. Uh, it's something to start keeping on your radar um, and, and building a plan uh, to address based on this regulation and this reality. So if we move on now to global warming potential and think about the, the other side of the original environmental graph I showed earlier, 
I'd like to go through and talk about now the more recent, the re relevant HFC regulations uh, that you should be thinking about in your business planning. And before I do that, uh, I want to stop for a moment and take our first poll question. So Kate, if you could help us switch over to the first poll. Just like to ask everybody if you could interact with the screen for a minute and let us know how knowledgeable do you feel about the status of US HFC regulations and their relevance to your business? So do you feel very knowledgeable, somewhat knowledgeable? You've heard of them, but you don't know the details or you have no knowledge of HFC regulations that may be impacting your business. So we'll give it a few seconds for everybody to select one of those options. All right, Kate, if it looks like folks have made their selection, uh, would you be able to push those results out? All right. So great to see that there's a there's there's nobody that has no knowledge of the regulations. Uh, about a third of the folks on this call feel very knowledgeable, and uh, the other two thirds somewhat or you've heard of them but don't know the details. So. Uh, hopefully, uh, for those very knowledgeable, hopefully this will match up with your understanding, or maybe you'll learn a few new nuggets. And for those that uh, have some knowledge of them, hopefully this will expand um, expand what you are aware of and, and give you some things to think about as you plan for the future. All right, Kate, uh, let me know if I need to do anything to take back presenting rights. Um, I think I just need to start sharing again. All right. Okay, so if we think about the HFC regulations, we've kind of classified them in three different buckets, right? Getting closer and closer to what it means to you and your business. So on an international level, I referenced this before, but the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol uh, was agreed to in October of 2016 by over 170 countries. And it's currently ratified by over 90 countries around the world. Uh, the US has not ratified it yet, um, but that is the international level agreement uh, to phase down the use of high GWP gases uh, in our sector, in our, in our industry. Uh, when you take that step and then you say, okay, now each country that has agreed to that or has signed on to that needs to create their own regulations in order to meet the international treaty. And so at the federal level, at the US federal level, the EPA had started to build regulations out to in anticipation of the Kigali Agreement. Uh, and that was through the EPA's Significant New Alternatives Policy Program, the SNAP program. Um, and so the SNAP program was actually originally in place uh, through the US Clean Air Act to regulate the ozone depleting substances to approve alternatives, alternatives to ozone depleting substances or remove ozone depleting substances from being allowed. The EPA began to use the SNAP program to continue to add new substances as allowed in different applications. So a new refrigerant can, can continue to be added. And they also began to remove higher global warming potential gases from their allowable uses in 2016 and 2017, and I'll give more details on that in the next slide. Um, in addition, at the federal level, there's been some more recent activity with a bipartisan Senate bill called the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act. So I'll give a high-level overview of what that bill uh, is trying to do and what the status is. And then there's also activity at the U.S. state level. So there are about half of the country has signed on, the governors have signed on to a climate alliance. And there's also some, and I'll explain what that means, there's also some specific activity in California at CARB, which is the California Air Resources Board. So we'll move on and talk a bit more about the U.S. federal activities in the SNAP program. So as I mentioned, in 2016 and 2017, the US EPA made certain HFCs unacceptable for use in those two SNAP rules. And the applications and the most commonly used HFCs are shown in this table below. 
However, the EPA was sued and the DC Circuit Court partially vacated those SNAP rules um, in the following year. Um, but the important thing to note is that even with the federal SNAP rules basically on hold, um, some states are adopting those SNAP rules and setting new dates for implementation. So what you can see here is that California, Vermont, Washington, and New Jersey have already agreed to continue to uphold the SNAP rules by the dates that are shown in this table. And if you take a particularly closer look um, at what is likely very relevant for those of you on this call in cold storage, you see the condensing unit implementation date and the cold storage warehouse implementation date. Uh, and so for new equipment, you can see that condensing units, new condensing units for 404A and 507 were not allowed in the state of California uh, as of January 1st, 2019 or as of January 1st, 2020 in Vermont and Washington. Um, in New Jersey, coming up here as of July 1st, new condensing units will not be allowed to be installed with 404A or 507. Now for retrofit, in addition for the condensing units, if anybody is retrofitting R22 condensing units to or another type of condensing unit with an older refrigerant to 404A or 507, that also is not allowed by those same dates. If you jump down to cold storage warehouses, you see the implementation date is related to new installed equipment and it's a little bit farther out, it's 2023. But given the time it takes for capital planning and projects and, and large projects, we felt it was important to highlight here that January 1st, 2023, uh, 404A, 507, 407A, and 410A will not be allowed in new equipment in those particular states. Okay, so just wanted to talk through that and let you know that there are also some additional states that are considering, considering implementing these SNAP rules despite the federal inactivity thus far. Um, so when you think about what could those states look like and where are they? So as I mentioned before, about half the country, uh, 25 governors have committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and upholding the Paris Climate Agreement goals. Uh, that demographic and alliance represents about over 55% of our population, about over 60% of the U.S. economy, and 40% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Several of those members, like the ones I already mentioned, are starting to adopt the federal SNAP rules that had been previously published. So other states that have expressed an interest to regulate HFCs include Connecticut, Delaware, and Maryland. Um, and just note that states that are adopting the SNAP rules have to publish their own implementation um, guidelines, and they may implement some special reporting and labeling requirements. So the light blue states are the ones that are members of the Climate Alliance. The dark blue already have put in those SNAP rules uh, into um, regulation. And you can see the orange line around um, California in addition to already adopting the SNAP rules into the state um, regulations, they also, as you likely have heard uh, and know, CARB has the short-lived climate pollutants measures, the SLCP measures that have been proposed, and those go beyond just the SNAP rules to look at sector-based uh, GWP limits as well as uh, service restrictions potentially or, or creative ways of looking at average GWPs, for example, across a food retailer's footprint. So uh, a lot of interesting things there. And at this time, the latest we've heard is that CARB intends to finalize the SLCP measures uh, in 2020. Of course, we'll, we'll stay tuned and stay in touch with them as we move through these uh, unprecedented times uh, with respect to what our country is going through. Um, now, if we move over to the right, uh, the AIM Act that I mentioned before, um, you have the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act, which is a Senate bill that was introduced in October, and then a similar bill introduced in the House in January. And the main objectives are really to gradually phase down the production and consumption of HFCs um, in a way that avoids a state patchwork of regulations, right? So as you can imagine, if you do business in multiple states, trying to keep up with, keep up with dates and implementations and differences between states, uh, could be a disaster, and so there is an effort 
um, to drive towards a common regulation at the federal level. And these particular bills um, would create 150,000, estimated to create 150,000 new jobs, directly and indirectly, um, with significant economic benefit over the next seven years. So, um, so just monitor those bills uh, and, and and pay attention to those in the news. Obviously, right now the the government has a, a, a bigger fish to fry right now with respect to the uh, economy and the pandemic, um, but certainly these discussions have not completely stopped and um, just stay tuned on that. Okay. So next I'd like to move on uh, beyond the regulations to some high level cold storage market trends as well as refrigerant selection. So from a market trend perspective, a few things that we're seeing in cold storage and hearing, uh, obviously there is an increased consumer preference for perishable and or packaged foods, and there's certainly a desire for instantaneous demand, which is driving the need for more cold storage and having food staged at the right place to be able to respond quickly to instant needs. Um, in addition, there's an increasing need for cold storage in the pharmaceutical industry for vaccines, temperature sensitive meds, etc. cetera. Um, what we've seen within the cold chain more broadly is that the refrigerated storage segment is growing at a faster rate than the transport segment. So cold, and cold storage accounts for about 50% of the cold chain market from a revenue perspective. Um, when you look at the warehouses themselves and the operating conditions and set points they run under, the demand for frozen storage seems to dominate over chilled. Um, and so these are just some trends we've been observing and watching. And one thing I'll say is, is given what we're going through right now, um, you know, there could be some new market trends that come out of this that could accelerate this further, um, could change the course of, of how we serve our industry. And so obviously we're eager to talk through that with you and understand what you're seeing and how we can best be positioned to support you and uh, your customers. So when we think about the trends from a refrigerant technology evolution standpoint, specifically in cold storage and, and beyond, uh, we always like to talk, think about the map of refrigerants, right? Everybody says we'd love to go back to uh, one refrigerant for everything, but we know that technology has evolved and in some ways it's evolved uh, for the better. Uh, and so, although the evolution can be a painful process sometimes. So, you know, back in the 1800s, early 1900s, we had the industrial chemicals, methyl chloride, ammonia, CO2, et cetera. Uh, DuPont invented um, the CFCs, the Freon at the time, R12, uh, R11. Uh, they were very high ozone depletion potential, high, very high GWP, global warming potential. Um, so in the mid 50s, um, HCFCs were also brought online, so you add a hydrogen to remove some of the chlorine to reduce the ozone depletion potential. So that's where R22 comes in, and R22 therefore has a, had a little bit longer life than some of the CFCs because it had a lower ozone depletion potential. Um, still relatively high GWP. Um, so in order to eliminate completely the chlorine containing molecules, uh, HFCs were developed and HFC blends in order to meet the various performance needs, uh, which were non-ozone depleting, no chlorine, hydrogen, just hydrogen, fluorine, and carbon. Um, but they did still have a relatively high GWP. So when you look at today and tomorrow, what we're seeing is we still have, certainly in this industry, in cold storage, the presence of ammonia and CO2. Um, and we also see the advent of HFOs and HFO blends uh, really becoming great options to help folks um, depending on uh, what their business needs are and their environmental needs are. So when we look to the future, we don't really see one silver bullet that can do everything. Um, we feel refrigerants in the future really need to balance uh, performance needs, safety, sustainability, and just consider the total cost of ownership that end users uh, need to factor into their business plans. So that really is what the Option Refrigerants portfolio is designed to do. It's time, designed to really be that optimal balance of sustainability, um, cost, safety, and performance. Um, so that's, I'm going to go a bit more in depth uh, on how Option can help do these things uh, and where we've seen uh, quite a bit of success today 
and how we can see that going forward. But before I do that, I'd like to switch over to a poll question. Uh, Kate, if you can push out. And I'm just curious, based on all the demographic of refrigerants that I just mentioned, uh, what percent of your facilities, or if you uh, service facilities, if you don't own them yourself, um, are still running with R22 refrigerant? So if you could select one, greater than 75%, 50 to 75%, 25 to 49% or less than 25%. And give everybody a minute to respond. All right. Kate, if you could push out the answers to the poll question, we'll see what folks said in terms of how many facilities are still running on R22. All right, so we've got quite a mix there, 17% still has over half, and about 50% has about 25 to 50%, and then uh, a third or less than 25%. So still quite a bit of exposure to R22 out there, uh, which makes sense. It's a, it's a great refrigerant. It's been used for a long time. So I think this next section will be um, particularly um, relevant um, for those that have R22 systems, but also if you don't and you're just thinking about, uh, I know there's a huge growth in the cold storage space. If you're thinking about new equipment and wanting some different options depending on what you're looking at doing and where you're trying to install those systems, uh, I think this next section will be relevant uh, as well. So how can Opion refrigerants help reduce this business disruption uh, and impact of potential regulations in the future? Okay. Click. And get to the next slide. Here we go. So Opion refrigerants, when we think about our entire portfolio, there's a few refrigerants that I'm going to focus on, but I didn't want to dig into those until I talked just for one slide a bit more broadly. So the way we've divided up our Opion refrigerant portfolio, we have what we call the XP series of refrigerants and the XL series of refrigerants. And so on the left-hand side, the XP refrigerants uh, are non-flammable, uh, low GWP, lower GWP than what they're designed to replace. Um, and so because they're non-flammable and they're designed to really match performance of the refrigerants that are out there today, they're excellent for both retrofit of existing equipment and can be used in new equipment designs. Um, they're relatively easy to use. They closely match R22 or the HFCs they're designed to replace. And in many cases, there's energy savings potential, both either thermodynamically from the refrigerant properties themselves or uh, and or through retrofit process of tuning the system back up. So um, there's a few products, specifically Optian XPs, that I'll be going into more detail on. But I also wanted to at least mention the Optian XL series, uh, which is a portfolio of refrigerants that we have developed that I would call ultra low GWP. And these are all designed really for new equipment. So they have a class 2L uh, flammability rating per ASHRAE. So that's mildly flammable or lower flammability. But these refer, so that's why they can't be used just to retrofit existing systems that are designed for non-flammable gases. But these are very high performing solutions and you can get to GWPs below 750, below 500, below 300, below 150, what your target is. Um, and so we'd be glad, you know, offline if you have some questions about um, new system designs or long-term planning, you just want to understand what those solutions are, we'd be glad to talk with you more on those as well, okay? But for the purposes of today, we just want to focus in on the XP series and, and two products in particular uh, that are non-flammable. So the first is Option XP40. And really, this is our uh, main replacement for both R22 as well as 404A or 507. Um, so it meets regulatory requirements. It's not ozone depleting. It is SNAP listed. Um, it's about a 70% lower GWP compared to 507 and about a 30% lower GWP versus R22. So very good performance match to R22 from a capacity and efficiency standpoint. 
from comparing to 404A or 507, you even get, especially in medium temp, you can get energy savings up to 12% reduction versus those. Um, it is non-flammable, as I said, ASHRAE standard 34 classification A1. So class A is the low toxicity and class one is the non-flammable. Um, it's compatible with existing equipment, as I said. We have detailed retrofit guidelines we recommend following. Um, it's commercially available. It's qualified by many OEMs. And if you have an OEM or if you are an OEM and you haven't yet qualified it or you're, you're curious if they've qualified it, don't hesitate to ask or reach out. And uh, Andrew and Jamie will be glad to follow up and, and get back with you on that. Um, but really, you know, this is known widely available technology. It's not fundamentally different. A, a technician servicing a contractor servicing equipment that they've been servicing with 404A or 507 or R22 or 407A is not really going to have to learn anything new when they're using XP40. Specifically, when we talk about R22 retrofits, since there was still a pretty large percentage of folks that have R22 systems, when you look at some of our experience with converting systems to XP40, uh, we've, we kind of highlight these five elements to consider um, when you think about avoiding business disruption. So first is um, XP40 minimizes the risk of business, business disruption more so than other replacement options without sacrificing performance. So when you think about if you have an R22 system, you know, what are your options? One option is to do nothing, right? Keep servicing it with R22 that you can buy, reclaimed, uh, recovered, uh, all of the inventoried uh, gas, right? And so that is certainly a solution, but the potential for business disruption, if it's a large charge size system especially, could be high, right? If, if you have a unexpected failure. Um, there's also an option to retrofit to other refrigerants that have higher GWPs. So that is certainly an option as long as it's allowed by the regulations, which um, many of them are today. The challenge with that is um, you are opening yourself up based on the regulations that we talked about to a potential change in the future, right? Another regulation when you have to go to a lower GWP solution. Whereas XP40 is basically as low as you can get from a GWP perspective without going to something that is mildly flammable. Um, to match the performance of R22. Um, so certainly you can match the performance of R22 and get lower GWP, but if you have to get into the world of flammability, that's no longer a retrofit solution. So with XP40's GWP less than 1400, it's well positioned to be a long-term retrofit solution in this market. Um, also, obviously you have the option to replace, right? Replace the equipment with a brand new system, whether it's with ammonia or CO2 or something else. Uh, but again, the, the disruption of the business when you think about the time to do that. So if you have a warehouse, likely you have a lot of food in it that needs to stay cold. Um, and managing that task of doing a conversion in the midst of trying to maintain your business operations. One, um, one customer that we have did several of these where they converted over to ammonia and then did some retrofits to XP40. The comparison was two days to four months of preparation and time to get the conversion complete. So think about all the time spent doing that preparation. Um, and so that's why we say XP40 does provide a reliable and very cost-effective solution. So when you think about that short-term spend and future cost avoidance, um, again, the comparison um, from some of our customer examples is that that retrofit could be a quarter of the cost of pulling everything out and putting in a new ammonia installation for a similarly sized facility. Um, when you think about sustainability from an environmental sustainability standpoint, we already talked about the environmental properties of XP40 and how it's compatible with uh, existing equipment, uh, allowing for operational consolidation. So if you have some R22 systems and some 507 systems and some other old refrigerant systems, you could consolidate them uh, likely all to XP40 um, and, and try to get down, reduce the number of refrigerants that you're juggling. Um, and it's proven, it's running well in 24 seven operations in tens of thousands of systems around the world. Um, and we'll talk about some of those case studies in a bit. Okay, before we talk about uh, some case studies, the other Option XP product I wanted to highlight is XP10, which is R513A. And again, this is another product that because it's non-flammable, it's designed to match the performance of 134A very closely. Um, 
it can be both retrofit and for new equipment. So from a regulatory perspective, it's non-ozone depleting, it's SNAP listed, its GWP is less than 750. So if you look at several of the chiller regulations out there um, in, in Canada, as well as some other regulations um, for ice rinks and other things, it, it falls below that 750 threshold. Um, it also has, it's, about, it's more than half the GWP of 134A. Um, it's a very good performance match to 134A. It's an azeotropic blend, so no temperature glide. Um, already mentioned the non-flammability and class A toxicity, low toxicity. And similar to what I said with XP40, it's commercially available, OEM qualified. If you are an OEM or if you have an OEM and you want to know if, what, what can be done to qualify it or if it's qualified, again, reach out to us and let us know. We'll be glad to work with you. Um, and again, similar. It's similar performance to what people are used to using, so it shouldn't require a brand new learned skill set. When you look at how do XP40 and XP10 compare to other common alternatives, I kind of compared them anecdotally on the previous two slides ago, uh, but just wanted to highlight some selection factors that we've heard from our customers and that we talk through when we consider you know, different things to look at from a sustainability standpoint. And when we talk about sustainability, um, we hear a lot, we need to think about not just environmental sustainability, but economic sustainability. Um, and so, you know, in these situations, there really is not a one-size-fits-all solution, um, as I mentioned before. So it's important to consider your own business realities. And in some cases, installing a brand new ammonia system might make the most sense. And in other cases, you need more flexibility, and some solutions provide that flexibility. So when you look at XP40 and XP10 through that lens, um, you can see they provide lower GWP than R22. They're non-flammable. They're safety class A. Uh, low acute toxicity, uh, which is another factor. Not a lot of people talk about acute toxicity. They talk about class A and non-flammable, but acute toxicity is another criteria in ASHRAE, looking at the um, immediate and sudden exposure versus ongoing workplace exposure. Um, and there's new installation cost considerations, as I already mentioned, whether or not something can be used to retrofit or not, and then because of the safety classifications, whether or not it can be used in unrestricted locations. So just all things to consider as you're doing your business planning and things that we'd be glad to talk with you more specifically about as it relates to um, you or your customers that are doing work in this area. Also, you know, highlighting performance and efficiency comparisons need to consider the system design itself, not just the fluid, right? So we could put up a lot of different thermodynamic charts and talk about performance comparisons on tables and capacity and efficiency and temperatures and all of these different things. And, and we certainly can and do do that with our customers at whatever conditions they want to talk through. Um, but just to highlight that fluids are just fluids until you put them in a system, right? And all of you know that very well. So when you look at and compare fluids, uh, it's important to consider what are the what are you looking for and what are you doing from an equipment design perspective to accommodate one fluid that if you applied it to another fluid you could get similar benefits right so if you want to spend the money to build in evaporative condensers electronic controls all of that for one type of fluid for co2 or ammonia you could do the same thing with an hfo a blend and potentially get similar benefits so just things to factor in as you start trying to compare your options and think about the future So before we move on to case studies, I think I have one last poll question to push out. And that poll question uh, is, how would you describe your experience level with HFOs and HFO blends? So would you say you've used them regularly? You have some use already and you plan to use them more in the future. You have some use, but you have no plans to use them more in the future. No experience, but you do plan to use them in the future, and no experience, and you have no plans to use them in the future. So I know there's a lot of <laughs> nuances to that question, so I'll give everybody a minute to sort it out and just make sure you're picking the right bubble. All right, Kate. All right, so looks like we already have about 17% of folks that use it regularly. 
uh, and that the remaining folks have some use or no experience, but you do plan to use them more in the future. So great to hear, and I hope that what we're covering today um, helps give you, if you're planning to use them more in the future, give you a few more ideas of, of things that could be done. And um, again, we'll talk at the end, but glad to work with you on those plans and putting together those plans and supporting you through that in, in your business and what you need. Um, all right, Kate, uh, if you, perfect. Thanks for switching back over. So in the last few minutes here before we open up to Q&A, I'd like to just talk through a few case study examples, both in the cold storage space as well as more broadly, just to get your mind thinking. I know some of you are, uh, you know, service maybe multiple clients, whether in cold storage or beyond. So I wanted to talk more broadly as well. And also for those in cold storage, give you a sense, even if you haven't used, if you're one of those that haven't used the uh, HFOs at all yet, um, you know, maybe this will give you some ideas of where you could use them. So one particular case study I want to highlight with XP40 uh, in a large cold storage warehouse um, logistics provider. Uh, so the profile of this customer, they have, you know, warehouses with 5 million cubic feet of refrigerated space. They need reliable performance 24-7, you know, over 10,000 pounds of refrigerant per warehouse. These were DX systems. Um, they initially trialed some of the ones I mentioned to you, R22 to ammonia in existing warehouses. Uh, and then they also trialed retrofitting an R22 system to XP40 at two of their warehouses back in 2017. Um, the results, these warehouses have been running smoothly for over two years. They, they continued to convert other, <laughs> the best The best result is, is and the, the, the proof is kind of in the pudding, right? If people do more, then that means it's working. If they stop, then that means it's not. So um, they've completed another six conversions subsequently, and they have plans to continue for the remaining of their warehouses. Um, they're also evaluating it for new installations versus 507, given the um, regulations I mentioned previously around SNAP implementation at state level. Um, they also, you know, the side benefit is, re you know, retrofitting R22 systems instead of just hoarding R22 gives you R22 that you can then use to service your other systems. Uh, so it gives you that that um, free free gas that you need, uh, buffers against the supply uncertainty as well as the cost. Uh, and minimizes that business disruption in the future. Now, if you look beyond cold storage, another area we've been doing quite a bit of work with is in the ice rink space. So a few, few, a few years ago, we became um, partners with the NHL, um, and Option is the official refrigerant solution of the NHL. We've been working hard with uh, community ice rinks across the U.S. and Canada. Um, there have been retrofits of R22 and 507 systems to XP40. There have been many new ice rinks going in with XP10. Uh, recently, our latest case study you can see here in, with, um, in the largest one, um, the Pepsi Center, the home of the Colorado Avalanche, successfully upgraded their system, which was 134A, over to XP10. Um, so there's been tremendous success in the ice rink space. Um, certainly a lot of folks that are familiar with ice rinks also are familiar with more commercial industrial refrigeration and, and the products have been extending into those spaces as well. So um, it's been a great partnership. We, we um, will be continuing this and, and you know have a lot of great uh, feedback from design engineers, OEMs uh, using these refrigerants in this space. So if you have questions specific to that, we're glad to answer those um, and talk with you after about that. And then beyond ice rinks and beyond cold storage, really, if you just look broadly across you know, the cold chain and commercial refrigeration around the world, we have, as I mentioned before, for both retrofit and new systems, we have tens of thousands of commercial refrigeration systems globally running on XP40. Um, you know, successful adoption with leading food retailers in each region of the world. Um, Again, glad to share some of those case studies with you if you have questions on energy results and performance and, and all of that. So so if we just zoom back out to the broad cold chain view of, of, of the world, um, obviously the cold chain is complex. There's a, there's a lot of needs from food manufacturing and processing to transport to storage uh, to all of our um, grocery stores that are working hard to keep their shelves stocked and to our home and our, our tables. And so... Uh, refrigerants obviously play a vital role in preserving that food safety and freshness um, and, and provide you that tool that you need to keep your business running or keep your customers' businesses running. So 
uh, just wanted to make sure you guys know that our team is ready to help you uh, in any way that you think uh, is of use. So whether you want to talk through kind of refrigerant management planning and trade-offs between different options, you know, what are what is a system that you really need to install on ammonia versus what could you get by with, you know, doing a retrofit or whatever. Um, retrofit support, training, engineering support, tech service support, that's the type of support that we provide. Um, so we're, we're certainly glad to um, engage with you when you're ready. Um, and so contact us. So I've provided my email address specifically here on this slide. Uh, and obviously we have a tech to tech line here uh, in the US and North America that uh, is glad to answer questions and, and concerns as well. And we have our website, option.com, with more information. So let me pause there. Got about 13 minutes left. Um, so I'll stay on this slide, but I think, Kate, uh, maybe we can go to the questions now. If folks have, um, if you haven't had a chance to ask any questions, feel free to type them in if you have any. Um, I'll let Kate take over and, and let us know and bring Andrew and Jamie online in, in case there's a technical question specific for Jamie or Andrew to answer. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, you can submit your question in the box in the GoToWebinar tool. I believe it should be to the right of your screen, um, and we will answer those questions. Um, but we've already gotten a few in the queue, so I really appreciate the, uh, the interactiveness of the, uh, the callers this morning. Um, so, Stephanie, this question is for you. If I retrofit my R22 system to R449A now, will I need to retrofit again to a lower GWP refrigerant later? Sure, Kate. Thanks, and thanks for the question. Um, so I think I mentioned this on one of the previous slides a bit, but um, if you think about what the criteria is that you need to meet in order to have a good retrofit solution, you need something that matches the performance of what you're pulling out, right? So match the performance of R22 in a way that doesn't give you a trade-off that you can't live with, right? If it's too low of a capacity or if the energy efficiency is too poor or if the temperature and pressure profile doesn't work, it's, it's not going to work, right? So you need a refrigerant that matches that performance profile um, and is non-flammable, right? So when you think about future regulations, one thing that uh, the EPA has said is that they don't intend through their regulations to obsolete equipment, right? So, so if you take that as a starting point, that equipment is not, you know, they might change what's allowed for new equipment, but they don't intend to obsolete existing equipment. And so um, with that, you kind of need solutions that get you to a more environmentally friendly and sustainable place that still work and are non-flammable. And as I mentioned before, XP40 really is about as low GWP as you can get and stay uh, non-flammable and meet the performance of an R22 system. So it's less than 1500 GWP, it's less than 1400 GWP, which is a line that's kind of been used even in California as they look at food retail space and average GWPs. So we're very comfortable that it's a long-term retrofit solution and, and we don't expect that um, if you retrofit your R22 system that you would have to do that again uh, before the, the, the end of the useful life of that equipment. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, Jamie, this next question is for you. I'll give you an opportunity to get yourself on mute. Um, if I want to switch a new design from R507 to R449A, do I need to add a discharge temperature controller? In some applications, yes. Um, 449A or XP40's discharge temperature is about, on average, 25 degrees higher than 404A. So depending on what evaporator temperature you're running at, uh, you may have to add a discharge temperature controller to um, maintain that discharge temperature, but you should always consult with the compressor manufacturer uh, to see if it needs to be installed or not. All right, thank you so much, Jamie. All right, again, just as a reminder, if you wish to submit a question, please do so through the GoToWebinar tool in the, the question section. Andrew, this next question is for you. I'll give you a chance to get yourself off of mute. Will the TEV sizing be okay when converting from R22 to R449A? What about from R404A to 449A? Is there an R449A TEV power element available? So uh, a lot of questions there. If I need to repeat anything, please let me know. Thanks, Kate. I think I, think I got it. 
So for R22 TXVs, um, in pretty much all cases, R449A is going to be compatible with them. The mass flow rates and suction pressure differences between R22 and R449A are very similar. Um, in most cases, in supermarkets and in cold storage warehouses, um, we have been seeing that post-retrofit, only minor adjustments to TXV might, might be necessary. Um, for 404A to 449A retrofits, there is a little bit more care that needs to be taken to the TXV post-retrofit. Typically, a TXV that uh, is sized for 404A will be slightly oversized for 449A. Um, in most cases, the sizing isn't so oversized that you need to replace the whole TXV. But uh, what we have seen in the field is that many end users are opting to put a R22 or a R449A power element on the 404A valve body to get better superheat control. Thank you so much, Andrew. All right, well, I got you on the line. Another question that came in is, what is the lowest evaporation temperature that can be reached with R449A? Um, well, that question really comes into play with uh, what the normal boiling point of the refrigerant is. So uh, off the top of my head, we can get an exact number, but I think the, the boiling point is around minus 40 F somewhere between minus 40, minus 50 F. So that's going to be the minimum temperature you can run a coil while maintaining a positive suction pressure. If you were to go to lower temperatures than that, you would uh, be running in a vacuum. So um, we can get more information if there's like a specific application. Um, but right around minus 40, minus 50 F is the lowest you're gonna get while maintaining a positive suction pressure with 449A. All right, thanks so much. And just as a reminder, as, as Stephanie has on her screen, uh, we obviously have the tech to tech uh, hotline and as well as email. Um, so if it's regarding a specific application, please reach out and they'd be more than happy to chat with you on, on your specific application. So Stephanie, I believe this question I'll direct re towards you. My R22 system is flooded. Will R449A work? Okay. Thanks, Kate. Um, and I'll, I'll start and I'll also make sure, Andrew, Jamie, if you want to add to it, you can. Um, so as we know, there's a lot of flooded 22 systems out there. Um, and historically, we have not used um, blends with temperature glide in flooded applications. So 22 and 507 have kind of been the predominant fluids in, in flooded systems beyond, you know, just ammonia. Um, more recently, I would say we have some experience with uh, customers doing some conversions on flooded systems. Uh, and so I would say if you have a flooded system and you're interested in possibly converting it, certainly reach out to us and, and let us know. Um, the answer is not as much of a solid no as maybe it was in the past. Um, there, there are some applications where we think there's uh, some promising opportunities. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Andrew uh, if you or Jamie, if you want to add anything, uh, feel free or you could say good enough and, and please reach out to us with specifics because obviously these systems are very complex and, and we want to know the specifics of the operation before we give a general recommendation. Yeah, I think you, you covered it well, Stephanie. Um, there's a lot of different um, design considerations with flooded evaporators where really no two systems are exactly the same. Um, we do have some uh, experience doing successful retrofits of this type of equipment, but we're really kind of evaluating it on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, we are really happy to help any end user out and do any kind of survey to see if R449A or some other fluid could be a suitable option for their um, for their R22 flooded equipment. All right, thank you so much, uh, Jamie. This next question I'm going to direct towards your towards you. Excuse me. When converting from R22 to R449, will I need to change the seals or the lubricants? Great question and a very common question. Um, yes, all seals should be looked at, especially the um, rubber seals or more commonly O-rings. Uh, Teflon papering gaskets are not affected. 
And the reason the uh, rubber seals need to be replaced is because of the swell rate. With R22 in the system, that seal has swelled. And when you go back with a, especially a non-chlorinated refrigerant, uh, that O-ring will not go back to its original state. So the refrigerant will leak around it. Uh, some of the more common components that might have O-rings in them would be liquid line solenoids. A good thing there is you can just buy a kit. You don't have to replace the body, just the, the internals. Ball valves, um, depending on the age of the valve, uh, the manufacturer of the valve could have uh, O-rings in it. So yes, all of the um, rubber seals need to be looked at and on the critical ones that can't be isolated, they should be changed. And the lubricant, Jamie, does, would that also have to be changed if you're converting? Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Um, yeah, any um, lubrication that is mineral oil or alkabenzene that is originally in the system will need to be changed out to polyester oil. And again, you probably ought to uh, consult the compressor manufacturer to make sure that you're putting uh, the proper type of polyester oil in that compressor. But yes, uh, an oil change will um, need to be made with the uh, Option refrigerants. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. All right, Stephanie, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question here as we come up to the hour. Uh, what solutions does Comoros have if I want to stay below 150 GWP for a new installation? Sure. So I mentioned we have the two different series of, of refrigerants. We have uh, the XP series and the XL series. So the refrigerants that would be less than 150 GWP are in, in the refriger for refrigeration applications uh, like cold storage would be that would be less than 150 GWP. We have an R22 404A like refrigerant, which we call Option XL20, which is the ASHRAE number is R454C. Uh, and we also have, we call it Option XL10, which is pure YF, uh, and that GWP is uh, less than one. Um, and so that's more like the 134A type fluid. So we do have a few fluids that are class A and, um, and uh, A2L, and then flammability class 2L. So those are two that we'd like to talk, you with, uh, to talk with you about more if that's an interest you have for a new design. Um, and also just like to understand if you are thinking down that path and considering HFO solutions, you know, what you're thinking about and what your design criteria are. Um, because we know as we look to the future, that's an area, you know, um, for some of the regulations that we'll need to consider. So uh, glad to talk with you more if you have specific questions on that side. Great. And should it be noted that... Good last question to end the, the webinar with, Kate. That was a good one. <laughs> no, no problem. And and just real quickly, it um I just want to note, and if I'm incorrect, please let me know that they are not these products that you mentioned, the XL20 and the XL10, excuse me, are currently not available here in North America, but are being currently used in Europe, correct? Yeah, they're available for testing and qualification and sampling and that kind of thing. They're not yet officially commercially sold uh, in the US market. Um, but but will be as the codes, as the standards are now getting updated, uh, the industry standards are now getting updated, and as the codes get updated to reflect those standards, um, we expect to see those, you know, finally get uh, officially registered in, in the SNAP Federal Registry and all of that. But um, XL10 YF is currently sold commercially in the mobile air conditioning space and has been for many years um, for automotive applications, um, but for stationary use, we are awaiting final SNAP listing, but we can, in the meantime, certainly work with end users on trials, testing, qualification, or, or you know, sampling as needed if you have a particular application with a question. So just reach out to us and ask for more information. Fantastic. I apologize for throwing that curveball at you. No, it's fine. <laughs> all right. Well, that concludes our webinar. We thank you all for attending. Um, we hope you've learned some. Um, something to this morning as well as just want to wish you all a, a safe day a healthy day and again thank you for all that you're doing to, to kind of keep food on our tables so with that we'll be signing off and uh we'll be talking to you soon thanks kate and thanks everybody have a great day